Hi everyone, and welcome to this Ask Me Anything. Uh, we have a question here from Jono Ward. Jono says, Hi James, thanks for your thoughts recently on the Ukraine situation. I've been thinking more about the dynamics of power and control we see in our society. It seems to me that one of the chief tools that we look to in order to deal with our feelings of fear, scarcity, separation and powerlessness is money. Money is something we look to as a source of power and control in our lives and something that gives us a feeling of security. I wonder if you have any thoughts on the role of money in our lives, both on a macroeconomic scale of global economic justice and on a personal level of not allowing our psychological lives to be shaped by economic forces. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah, great question. Um, so I completely agree with your assessment that the way we use money or the very existence of money is based around issues of fear, separation, scarcity, powerlessness, and trying to come up with a method to concentrate power so that we can kind of coerce each other to um, to do things that we, that we want instead of having economies based around care and mutual support. So the way that I tend to think about this in order to kind of in an attempt to think clearly, I find it really useful to kind of project back in time and see what we can learn about how humans used to live before civilization, to see what our kind of, what ways of living align with our evolved physiology. So, you know, economies are just kind of ways of living, ways of getting things done. Um, whether those things are getting food and resources to build shelter and stuff like that, which is the kind of behavior that we we tend to think about when we're dealing with the kind of modern economy, um, particularly kind of coming up with efficient ways to extract materials and use them to provide kind of goods and services. But another thing that is an aspect of the economy is care, care for each other, um, care for the environment. And that's factored in far less in our um, current global economy. But if you look to the way we humans used to live before civilization, Care seems to be one of the things that is most fundamental to our, our kind of evolved capacities. You know, we we still see this when we engage with people in, through things like friendship um, and in relationships, you know, families. There's always a kind of, there's an instinctive knowing that there should be an ability to hold space for each other and to listen to each other's problems and support each other. and before these kind of abstract, huge systems that can concentrate power came into existence, that seems to be a fundamental aspect of how humans have lived. Um, and this brings me back to uh, a quote which I mentioned to Ruth Kenner um, in our conversation on anarchism, which is a kind of you know approach to moving towards um, systems where people are empowered instead of being coerced through systems like money. Um, quote from the anthropologist David Graeber, who died recently, um, about how we could reconceptualize the economy as how we take care of each other, which I think is a is a really useful uh, thing to do to, to try and envision a world where where that's how we think of the, the economy and the goal of it. But it seems the trajectory of history, you know, since the written word came to existence, has been around concentrating power and before uh, modern capital was the thing uh, you know there was still as soon as you have stocks of grain in the first civilizations then there are it sets the stage for it to be possible for bureaucracies to arise to arise that kind of where you have people who um, are in control of that supply and then they have a certain amount of power and they can give it to, you know, the system then becomes available to be played and certain people can um, get more power than others. Uh, interestingly, I, as a side point, um, there was a great book from David Graeber's last book before he died um, with a colleague of mine from UCL called uh, David Wangro, who's a, um, an archaeologist. They cover this book, The Dawn of Everything, which um, takes this, the conventional narrative, which is that uh, it's kind of as soon as you get these these agricultural surpluses, these surpluses of food, then you necessarily need bureaucracy 
and hierarchy and concentration of power and all that kind of comes along um, as a kind of necessary way to manage it. And they're saying kind of whilst, I mean, I would say, you know, the concentration of uh, something like brain is, is, makes it possible for those kinds of forms of power to become concentrated. But they're pointing out that it's not actually an inevitable conclusion. They point to multiple um, civilizations, well, or settlements that in, include thousands and thousands of people that seem to live peacefully um, with agricultural surpluses. And there's no evidence of bureaucracy, no evidence of centralization. It seems to be kind of egalitarian modes of organization. Um, and they, they're kind of arguing that we, we don't have to feel like just because we live in this agricultural based civilization where there is a surplus of, of food and therefore power, um, that it necessarily means we have to live in kind of modes of domination and hierarchy. Um, but you can get concentration of power um, when there is surplus of food. Also, as, as another side point, um, I think it's interesting that the first megalithic structures, um, first stone circles, seem to be erected before agriculture. Uh, it was thought until recently that you needed, again, this kind of excess of, of calories and um, perhaps the authority of one person who has, who's kind of ruling at that point with the power of access to the food to command everyone to do this. But it actually seems that people came together and did this before agriculture. And to me, I guess it is possible that this was done in a kind of purely democratic way, but it, it's also possible that um, social capital was the original form of capital. So say a figure who was integral to the community, like a shaman or someone who could do healing work, perhaps just through their perhaps well-earned respect and ability to guide the community, maybe these were the first people who had a form of wealth and concentrated power. Um, but again, maybe it was more justified than inherited wealth that one doesn't have to earn. Uh, so yeah, this is all to say, I think you're totally right that the world we live in now is based around a trajectory of um, power becoming concentrated, that leading to an abandonment of systems of care that keep us grounded, keep us resolving our emotional issues in this you know, day in, day out through supporting each other. And the psychology, you know, it requires, um, it requires skills like shamanism and doing emotional work and community, you know, wise guidelines around community, community bonding, that all of that is necessary to stop us giving in to our fear-based egoic, um, more childlike psychology. Uh, and I, th I think the history of, you know, the globe at this point is that it's been dominated by that egoic, fear-based, um, immature mindset that doesn't want to listen to wisdom, doesn't want to think long-term or engage in counterintuitive practices, say like rites of passage, for example, which might be scary for you, but actually there's a wisdom, it's better in the long run if you go through them. Instead, we have this, this you know, I think that mode has become unbound, basically got free of these webs of, um, of care that would usually rein each other in and keep us in a kind of healthy balance. Uh, and so I think, you know, once you get people with immense amounts of power, then if there are multiple ones, then they go to war and it just, you get more trauma, more, uh, more emotional stress. And then it just kind of, that pushes us more in this mode. So it's like a feedback loop to the point right now where, you know, through, I mean, when we're talking about money as it exists today, you know, this is all very kind of the broad strokes of what I see psychologically has, has happened. But if we actually think of the last, you know, a few hundred years, uh, through to the Middle Ages, when uh, money and capital really became a thing in its in its modern forms, it was all based around this concept of enclosure. So there used to be you no know, common pasture land where um, where animals would graze, and actually the history of this seems to have kind of begun in England, where powerful you know uh, forces like the monarchy would just choose to take this common land from people, enclose it, put a fence around it, and enforce that with force. Um, and so they basically just say, this is ours now. And it's important to kind of realize that the, the growth that we see uh, in, in economic terms is partly, or kind of always an illusion, because every time you're 
every time you're saying that okay there's growth over here because we have um, you know we've gained extra resources and all the damage it does is we call an externality it's we're, we're putting outside some conceptual boundary uh, so it's, it's actually a kind of a trick where if you have a unitive mind view you know, world view where you feel yourself to be part of nature and you care about nature suddenly climate change and ecological devastation is not an externality it's affecting you if you have this ecological sense of self and we can see that the ecological sense of self is actually it's more real and more true because now if we're facing it if we're looking at climate change um, and ecological devastation clearly we can see it's going to affect us so clearly it's part of our sphere of concern so i think yeah that we're living in a, in a mode where that's dominated by these kinds of dynamics and they fit with the psychology of of fear and shame and wanting to kind of if you're if you feel isolated and scared and the idea of being emotionally vulnerable with people and requesting care feels overwhelming and, and terrifying then in that mode the only other place to go really is coercion and manipulation and that's the the psychology of our civilization is let's isolate ourselves it feels safer to be isolated and if there's someone weaker than me who i can coerce to kind of relate to me in, in some way or i have power over them in some way um that's a mode of operation that, that is is pathological and stressful for everyone involved but it, it kind of it has its own perverse logic um you witness this with a kind of emotional abuse that you get with with people with kind of narcissistic personality disorder there's this this such for when it, when it's based in trauma there's such deep wounding that there's this feeling that you're never actually going to be loved and uh, it's not really safe to engage with people so you need to manipulate and coerce and so this method of, in, of enclosure it's not only you know you enclose the land that we need to live and we need to grow our own food on um and there's this pretense that somehow it's justified you know like um but it's always done through force i imagine like i imagine if with um artificial intelligence right the say just one billionaire one of the current kind of people working on this gets across the finishing line first and then the economy basically collapses and so they have all the power um, and they become unimaginably wealthy and imagine if that goes so far that actually the rest of us have so little um money like so little ability to purchase things that the economy kind of collapses it doesn't make sense anymore um because no one's actually taking part in the economy that would be a way that the system would kind of eat itself um, and then it would disappear and collapse but imagine in that moment what would happen when um the people kind of with their pitchforks <laughs> go, you know, go up to the the trillionaire or whatever number it would be at this point and say you know we demand that you stop that you share you know, everything you have because the rest of us are, are suffering the if you imagine that moment when the economic system is gone they actually have no the only wealth they have is their ability to have their guards and to basically protect whatever they're hoarding whatever food stores they have presumably at that point because that's the stuff that's kind of intrinsic worth that's their only power at that point and so it suddenly becomes clear in that moment that it was always about enforcing the using force to protect private property that's been taken um that's been expropriated from the commons uh, always by force never because it's justified so i think these are the kinds of dynamics that are, that are going on and when it comes to you know kind of as you say global economic justice at the moment i'm trying to kind of educate myself around the economics of um ecological economics because it seems to me it makes sense to factor in thermodynamics of our life on, the, on this planet and seeing the economy as part of an energy system which is the way it's perceived in, in ecological economics and within that there's a lot of uh, talk around the concept of degrowth where we might move to an economy based on meeting our needs rather than concentrating power so instead of this kind of psychotic rush to concentrate power at the extent of the you know the expense of the environment we instead create economies that are smaller in terms of gdp but actually we're living better lives because we we have more systems around care and supporting each other and this kind of leads me into you know you were saying on a kind of micro scale on our, on our lives the money the role money plays in our lives if you have any advice around that and my you know thinking is 
a similar thing can happen in one's life where you can either be unconsciously engaged in a rat race where you feel you need to be taking part in kind of the consumerist momentum of civilization uh, or you can realize that that's actually a lot of that energy is it's kind of propaganda to keep you taking part and making money for other people and if you mindfully become aware of what really brings you happiness whether it's you know spending time with building community with with friends with loved ones meditation all of these things are not expensive right uh and there's kind of trite truisms like the best things in life are, are free are, are really true so in one's own life you can try to extract yourself from these coercive systems by instead of aiming to just earn as much money as possible out of a need to have as much power your ability to coerce other people and get them to do things for you if you're willing to kind of you know live a more economically reined in life uh but a more meaningful one to me that's the that's what's always made sense yeah so thank you for an excellent question um you can take part in the next one by going to patreon.com forward slash dr james cook or youtube.com forward slash dr james cook and you can leave questions there thanks again thanks for listening if you're watching on youtube please like and subscribe and if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience you can leave a review on apple podcasts Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.